Hi everyone. This video is a book review about a book that was on my Amazon playlist for about, or wish list, for about seven years before I actually purchased the book. And the title of this book is Healing Teas from Around the World. And it was written by Sylvia Schneider with a foreword by Terry Willard. Now, I have not been a tea drinker for that long. I've only been drinking tea since the year 2013, so under a decade of tea drinking. I selected this book primarily because I wanted to find a book that contained not only exotic recipes, but also recipes that were beneficial for my personal health. And I believe that this book takes the cake when it comes to those exotic recipes and recipes that are good for you health-wise. I also enjoyed some other factors of the book, but before I get into my book review, let me tell you a little bit about the author, Sylvia Schneider. So it says, uh, Sylvia Schneider is a freelance writer and medical and scientific editor. She works as a medical journalist and is the author of numerous books. Schneider is a student of ectrophology, the relationship between ecology and nutrition and communication science. She lives in Eckernford, Germany. I tried to research this author online and I couldn't find that much information about her. I don't know if she is still alive or if she is still living in Germany. As far as um, books go, I only came across two or three other books that she wrote, even though it says numerous books in the biography. Also, this book at the front says Natural Healing Series, and I could not find any other book that is in this supposed series. So this book right here is about 20 years old. It was published in 2001. I know that some of her other books are about health, but I don't know how in deeply into detail she goes as far as the herbs in her other books. At the end of this video, I'm going to show you some of or all of the herbs that I have in my current collection of herbs. Some of them are in powders, some of them are loose herbs, and some of them are in tea bags. And I will give you a little biography of what each of the herbs does. Now let me start off by telling you what I liked about this book and what I disliked about this book. So let's start off with what I liked about this book. What I liked about this book was the beautiful photography. This photography was so stunning, it evoked feelings of meditation, solitude, and peace. The photographer is named Wolf Dieter Bacher, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm assuming that this person is German, and I'm also making the assumption that this book was originally published in German because the translation was done by Maya Agnes. I really liked how the photographer set up the um, the herbs and for every chapter, like this one is for the Americas. I, I want to say that's that's not Palo Santo, but just beautiful flowers. So if you are a person that truly enjoys looking at beautiful pictures, I think you would really enjoy this book as well. Another thing I liked about this book is the author went into such detail about the herbs. She, of course, based on her background, she has a background in medical or medicine and science. So not only was it very scientific, but it also, I guess, teaches the reader how to implement these herbs into their life, like how the herbs affect the physical body. She also goes into the history of some of the herbs like 
the cultural stories that went along with the herbs, how it was used in metaphysics, why the herbs are called this name or how the names change based on the geographical location of the herb. So for example, ginseng. Ginseng in India would be called ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is Indian ginseng. Then you have Siberian ginseng, which is el eleuthero. And you also have Korean ginseng. So herbs like that, that vary from place to place. She also divided this entire book in um, by continents. And with each country or each country that she mentioned for said con continents, she would tell about or talk about their herbal medical system. So now that we are on the topic of continents, this is what I dis disliked about the book. So what I disliked about the book is I feel the title was misleading. The title says Healing Teas from Around the World. So when I read this title, I expect teas from around the world, almost every single continent except for Antarctica, unless there's a scientist there that is a tea connoisseur and knows about herbs and makes their own concoctions based off of the limited resources there. But this lady, she only wrote about teas from Asia, North America, South America, Europe, and Arabia, wherever that is. I don't know where Arabia is. I don't know if it's like a part of Asia with Africa combined or if it's something else. But she did not touch Australia and she did not touch Africa at all, which really confused me. I don't know why she did that. I don't know why she completely skipped over these two continents in particular even though she went into detail about all of the different herbs from all of these other continents, she completely did not say anything about Africa or anything about Australia. And I have a few um, assumptions of why she did that. I don't know if she did it because there was no space in the book, like they had limited space and they could only write about so many things. I don't know if she didn't have access to some of the recipes from those particular continents. So for example, Australia. I know a lot of Europeans were sent to Australia or shipped to Australia. So maybe the teas from Europe cover teas in Australia because it's colonized by, you know, Europeans. Or maybe she could not get recipes from the Aboriginal people there because they didn't trust her. A lot of these groups don't trust invaders and they're not going to share their ancestral recipes, which I can understand. So perhaps she didn't have access to that in regards to Australia. But Africa, there's so many places she could have gone to get tea recipes. She could have gone to Ethiopia. She could have gone to South Africa, Morocco, so many places. But she didn't even mention Rubo's tea, which is an a, I want to say a South African tea. She didn't mention Yohimbe, which is an African herb that helps stimulate the libido. What was weird was she put Egypt in the section called Arabia instead of putting it in Africa. I still have to research what Arabia, exactly what Arabia is. Is it African countries and Asian countries kind of in a, a mesh? I don't know why she took Egypt out of Africa and placed it in Arabia. But I had a problem with that. And another problem I had was she mentioned repeatedly in this book that in the back of the book, if I wanted to contact this, um, this store or contact this person or whatnot, that I could just use the information in the back of the book and contact them. However, there was no extra index in the back of my book. It only had an index, a glossary, or not a glossary, but just alphabetical order where I could find different things. But I could not find anything where I could contact people. Perhaps my copy is an older edition and it wasn't included, or maybe they just didn't put it in my particular copy. But that made me really mad <laughs> because I like having some way to get more information after I finish your book. Huh. So now let us get started on these different chapters. 
the first section that she has is Asia. And she starts off with China. She talks about traditional Chinese medicine and the layout of it. She mentions the five elements, the meridians, et cetera, et cetera, the pillars of Chinese medicine. She basically gives an overview, a brief overview of how this medicine works, the, the concrete basics, and then moves along to the recipes. She focuses on essential herbs of Chinese medicine, and she does this with every chapter. Whenever you, whenever she focuses on some type of country or culture, she will have a page where she focuses on the essential herbs that are used in that particular country, branch of medicine or culture, which I truly liked. So for Chinese medicine, she has astragalus, Chinese wolfberry, angelica, chrysanthemum, and some other things. This chapter actually helped me understand some of the products that I sell at my job because I work selling health products or natural health products. And one of the teas, Bravo tea, most of the teas use herbs from traditional Chinese medicine. And at one point I was looking at the herbal blends and wondering why they kept using astragalus and peony over and over and over in so many different blends. But now upon reading this chapter, I have a better understanding that these herbs are part of the tradition of Chinese medicine. She also, after she mentions the herbs, she gives recipes for how to make the herbs. So I will share one recipe with you. Let us see. Lady Beauty Tea, here's one. Chinese ladies swear by this ancient and classic beauty aid for women. The beauty tea is supposed to work by increasing the circulation in the facial capillaries or capillaries. I don't know. Thus making the skin appear younger, fresher, and rosier. Kidney function is also increased by it. Menopausal women will benefit from the hormone-like components of Lady Beauty tea because they stimulate the female libido. It is 3.5 ounces of the tea mixture and it contains 1.4 ounce Longjing green tea, 0.4 ounces Chinese wolfberry, and 1.8 ounces of ground lotus seeds. This tea is only steeped once. Using one tea bag, fill the cup with hot water. Let it steep for about five minutes and enjoy. To produce visible results, it is best to drink the tea daily for long periods. Chinese women drink the tea early in the morning, after rising, and after each meal. Drinking three to six cups a day is recommended. I also enjoyed that she put warnings for some of the recipes. There are some tea blends that you can take while you're pregnant. There are some you can take while you are conceiving. There are others you cannot take if you are carrying a child or if you're on some type of heart medicine or have some type of pre-existing condition where the herbs can um, either aggravate that condition or affect the medicine that you are taking. So I thoroughly enjoyed that she added the warning, mainly so she wouldn't get sued and also so you won't get hurt trying to replicate these recipes. I also think it was interesting that um, she put like how many cups a day to drink. There are some teas you can only have maybe once a week. There's some you can drink for six months. There's some you can drink every day. There's some you only drink when you're sick and some that you drink when you're well. So it's always good to research what tea you're drinking, how long you can drink it, all of those different things. And sometimes you'll have to switch things up a bit. So the next chapter, oh, here's one, is Tea Against Men's Hair Loss. I'll try to keep it balanced for like men and women. So tea, men's tea against hair loss. Um, the hair is influenced by the kidneys and the treatment of the blood by the spleen. This recipe can help by nourishing the blood. 0.4 ounce knotweed, 0.1 ounce stinging nettle seeds or dried nettle, 1 tablespoon taiga ginseng, 0.2 ounces wolfberries, 0.2 ounces ground eucomia, E-U-C-O-M-M-I-A, and 1 and 1 fourth cups of water, U 
Prepare medicinal soup out of these ingredients by simmering them for 20 minutes to reduce the liquid to three ounces, which you drink. Brew up the same ingredients at night, but do not keep them overnight. It helps to continue taking this tea for six weeks. Those who wish to benefit their hair even more can take the Chinese tonic Qi Zi Bu Ji, which contains important nutrients for the hair and scalp. Hmm. I like how in traditional Chinese medicine, they have traditional tonics that use the same herbs over and over and over for hundreds and thousands of years. The next Asian country she has is Japan, which was very interesting. She goes into detail about the green tea ceremony. Now, out of my ignorance, I did not know many details about the green tea ceremony. I just thought you maybe meditated and then poured the tea. But I did not know that you had an entire process of preparing this tea, preparing your body, preparing the tools, preparing the guests before and after the ceremony. I did not know that. And I thought that was fascinating. She also talks about the different green teas, the different qualities of the green tea. There's matcha, sencha, gyokuro, bancha, um, matcha, no, 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 matcha is used in the tea ceremony. Sencha is the most popular tea in Japan, according to this author. Bancha is the lowest quality green tea. It is made from the older leaves of the tree after the first harvest. She also gives seven rules for preparing the green tea and snacks at the end of the chapter. Green tea snacks that you can make while you're drinking your green tea. For this medical system, she mentions Kanpo, K-A-N-P-O. I don't know if it is Kanpo or Kanpo, but Kanpo, its whole thing is simplicity. Kampo's use of herbs is distinctly different from Chinese herbal medicine. Japanese herbalists place greater emphasis on the purity of the ingredients, and they have developed their own recipes. In contrast to traditional Chinese medicine, which often prescribes extremely high dosages, Kampo has deliberately aimed at keeping dosage to the minimum required. As far as what I've read about Japan and their, their branches of medicine, I have noticed that they like to add other people's stuff to their stuff. If it works, they just incorporate it into their. It's almost like a growing amorphous or progressive tradition. I also thought that it was kind of ironic because a few years ago, I read a book by this Japanese woman and it was about Japanese skincare routines, and she also mentioned that less is more. She didn't emphasize getting more products for your skin. She emphasized getting less products for your skin. One recipe that I will share with you from Japan is Mu tea. It is either Mu or Mu. It is spelled M-U. Mu tea is a specialty of macrobiotics. It is revitalizing and regenerative. George Oshawa, the founder of the School of Nutrition, composed this tea originally from 16 ingredients, some as exotic as root of Japanese peony, sea nettle, bitter thistle, licorice root, ginger root, and Chinese digitalis. Since these ingredients are generally unavailable in the West, there now exist some packaged mu teas based on Dr. Oshawa's model, most of them with fewer ingredients. And this tea recipe is easy. You just take one bag of new tea to three cups of water. And you, um, you cook the contents for about 12 minutes in three cups of water. Those with digestive problems or a cough or menstrual cramp should increase the cooking time to 30 minutes. And this is the appropriate daily dose until half of the liquid has boiled away. So if you are one that loves to research and loves to find things on your own, you can look up the names of these different people that she mentions in the book and try to find their website. I try to drink tea as much as I can because I am an avid worker. I work all the time. I help run the store at my job. So it's, it's hard for me to get all my nutrients because sometimes I'm 
I just don't feel like cooking. So I might like make some chicken or throw my herbs on my chicken or throw it in my soup and just try to eat. So my goal is just throwing the herbs in my water so that I can have some type of energy to function throughout the day. Also, as I get older, I try to add more potent herbs to my tea mixture. So next month is my 32nd birthday. And my whole goal for these herbs is to, I guess, either prolong or increase my fertility in case I want to have children one day. Then she goes and talks about Ayurveda and also Tibetan medicine. Now with Ayurveda, what I think is very interesting is a lot of their recipes contain milk. And I can't drink milk, but I do like milk. I think that milk is a very beneficial ingredient, even though a lot of people are against it, mainly because the milk now is very poisonous. It's filled with hormones. It's not like raw milk from cattle that are grass-fed and happy, getting all of the nutrients that they can from nature. So in Ayurveda, there was a book I read a couple of years ago called Almond Eyes and Lotus Feet. And one of the tea recipes from there was, if you want to have a child with a beautiful complexion, the mother, while she's pregnant, should drink a cup of warm milk with strips or petals of saffron, like strips of saffron in it. Saffron is a very expensive herb, but it's a very powerful herb. And you drink this tea throughout your pregnancy so that your child can have beautiful toned skin when it comes out of the womb. Maybe they like milk because, did I mention this earlier? I said the cow is sacred. I'm sorry. I'm just very tired from working all week. The next section that she mentions is Arabia. And for some reason, as I said, she puts Egypt in Arabia. And she goes into detail about Egyptian medicine. I was kind of done when I started reading this section because she says, Egyptian medicine, just like our own, derived largely from medical theories developed by the Greeks. I'm like, what, lady? I'm pretty sure that's not what happened. I'm pretty sure the Greeks came to the comedic people and got or stole stuff, but okay. The best known physician of ancient Greece was Hippocrates, whose code of medical ethics underlies the Hippocratic Oath, still taken at some medical schools by students embarking on the study of medicine. I just, this chapter, this whole section made me uncomfortable. That's why I didn't really absorb the information of the tea recipes, because I'm like, you obviously didn't do your research. You have Hippocrates as a father of medicine when it was really Imhotep and different African women who were the fathers and mothers of medicine. In fact, Hippocrates even referenced Imhotep. But some of the recipes in here were good, but I'm just not going to go into it because I, I don't know how accurate this chapter is that she wrote. I don't know. I, when you have an outsider writing your own story, you're going to get some misinformation about it. But some of the comedic people, they had a lot of herbs. In fact, for her essential herbs mentioned in Central Herbs and Spices of Arab Medicine, there's so many of them like wormwood, basil, greens, oak, etc., etc. But we're going to skip over this chapter. She also goes into the Americas. She combines North America and South America into one section, even though I feel they both could have just had their own specific section because it is so vast and diverse. But she talks about, uh, let's see, papaya leaf tea. Okay. The papaya improves digestion, calms the stomach, and frees the intestines of worms. The fruit also contains papain, the enzyme that splits protein molecules and deconstructs dead cell material, thereby detoxifying the body. Furthermore, papaya is rich in vitamins. Since 1552, papaya leaves have been sold, have been used in Europe. 
for healing and continue to be sold at most local health food stores. You can also use it on your skin to beautify your skin. Huh. Anyway, next section is Europe, which she goes into so much detail about Europe. Like, oh my God. She has... Monastic medicine, which she mentions Hildegard von Bingen. I think that was a good person to mention because Hildegard von Bingen did write a lot of um, theories about herbs and had her visions and had her own little healing book. So I think this was the perfect person to use for an example of monastic medicine. And she talks about her and her life and goes into some of the herbs that people in monasteries use, such as spelt stinging nettle, greater celandine, wormwood. Here are some of the potions from St. Hildegard von Bingen. One is for arthritic pain. And I'm going to t share this recipe with you because a lot of our customers come to us and they will have pain in their joints and arthritis. So if you're a person dealing with that, this recipe may help you. Stinging nettle for arthritic pain. Whereas Hildegard recommends this tea against worms, modern herbal healers consider it useful against rheumatic complaints. To prepare the tea, as it is given here, you will need a juicer. If this tea is too troublesome for you, you may find a similar mixture, prepared mixture in your health food store. So it is one part stinging nettle, one part cotton grass juice. Walnut tree leaves amounting to the same weight as the two juices combined. One squirt of vinegar. Like, how much is a squirt? It's like much honey. Well, of course. Of course it's going to be much honey because you got vinegar, you got nettle. This is really bitter. And you got walnuts. About six cups of water. Bring all the ingredients except for the honey to a boil. Skim off the foam and strain out the plant debris. Sweeten with honey before drinking. With respect to the dosage, Hildegard says, for 15 days, you should drink this in moderate amounts on an empty stomach, but after meals abundantly. If you opt for the packaged tea, take two cups a day for two weeks. So hopefully if you have time and you have arthritis, you can make these teas. You can also use rose hips and uh, one teaspoon of dried or chopped rose hips to one cup of water for colds. You can use oat straw tea for, I don't know, so many other things. She also goes into alchemy. Maybe I skipped over that chapter. She goes into alchemy in Europe, which I was confused because... In different cultures, you had shamans and various people, but you had Chinese alchemy, you had African alchemy. I don't know why she placed it in Europe. I think it should have just not been in any particular continent. It should have been at a different section of the book, as well as the chapter for witches. That should have been in a, another section because every continent had their own magical people or their own shamans or their own medicine men and women. So I feel that could have been in another section of the book for all of the continents. Huh. Anyway, so the chapter that I really liked was the one about witches. Because, you know, I read a lot about the occult. Witches' herbs are classified into four groups according to their use. Poisonous plants for harmful magic. Plants that deliver drugs for the soul's flight. Women's plants used for contraception, birth, and abortion. Herbs used as sexual stimulants. Now, some of these herbs for witches, and witches can be men and women, but some of these are for witches. You can use them in your love spells or your hate spells. You can use them to attract. You don't have to consume them. You can just use them in your workings. You can even use... um. Well, I'll explain another herb later. But in this chapter, she mentions that some of the the herbs could be rubbed onto the skin and it would make the, the witch have some 
psychoactive experience. They might feel like they're flying. They might have hallucinations. They also would use some of the herbs to increase libido or to abort a baby if the woman didn't want the baby anymore. Using it for different stages of life. Some of these herbs are very, very dangerous. And some of them in certain amounts can kill you. So if you are the type that likes to experiment with different herbs, I would do your research. Especially if you're doing something occult-wise, make sure that you research all of the herbs that you're using, especially the nightshades. Okay, one tea that she mentions in this chapter is a tea to strengthen the erotic aura, and this is for women, but if you're a man, I think you can substitute the herbs that she mentions in here for women with herbs that boost testosterone, and perhaps it'll give you the same effect. But this will alter the feminine scent. It is one handful of cherry blossoms, one handful rose blossoms, and it must be rosa centifolia, one handful linden blossoms whole or rubbed, and two cups of water. At the time of the full moon in April at about 10 in the morning, collect your handful of cherry blossoms from a tree and spread them flat to dry. Mix them when dry with equal amounts of rose and linden blossoms. Take one tablespoon of the mixture, cover it with boiling water. Let stand covered for 10 minutes and then strain. Take your aphrodisiac potion with a tablespoon of honey about an hour before you go out. This tea is very special. When a person drinks it, the scent of the blossoms is transferred into the sweat. The woman is, is perfumed from within. If you like, and the scent she gives off is irresistible to men. Naturally, it would be a shame to mask this intoxicating personal aroma with a synthetic fragrance. So for this one night, you might consider doing without deodorants and perfumes. I'm like, okay. But if you're a man and you want to attract a woman or a man or whatever you want to attract, perhaps you can substitute these herbs with herbs that are high in testosterone or like boost testosterone. There's also another plant she mentions in here, which is the yew tree, Y-E-U. And she states that all parts of this tree seem to be poisonous. The yew has been a sacred tree for longer than we can remember. The Druids used to assemble under yews and the witches took over this tradition. They carved their broomsticks out of yew wood. If you wish to experience the secret of yew, sit under one on a hot day or a warm, humid night. Under such weather conditions, the yew will give off a volatile, psychoactive substance called taxine. After 10 minutes, you will feel intoxicated. I think that is kind of interesting. It makes me wonder how many spiritual gurus that sat under trees and different things were actually having hallucinations based off of the plant giving some type of scent or aroma. I wonder if that's what happened with the Buddha, but I don't think the tree he sat under emitted an aroma like that. I don't know if it was a bonsai or a bodhi tree, but yeah, that was a very interesting read. I do recommend this book if you are one who just likes pictures and um, likes to read about herbs and also have a scientific twist to them. So even though I didn't like she didn't include Africa, I still recommend this book. I think it was very informative and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now I'm going to show you some of the herbs from my collection. I have herbs that are in powder form. I have some that are in tinctures um, and some that are in tea bags. As I stated earlier, I run my friend's store, so I barely get any sleep and I'm always just very, very sleepy. I take the herbs just to keep me going when I really should be eating food. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to increase the herbs I'm taking, and I'm also trying to increase the amount of food that I am eating. But these herbs actually keep me going throughout the day.
have baskets. This is cute. Yeah. You see my son? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Baskets. First basket. This is holy basil. Holy basil. Vana. I think there's different types of holy basil because at my job, we have holy basil Vana, Rama, and Krishna. I know that Rama and Krishna are deities from Hinduism. So I don't know what Vana is, but this is what it looks like. This herb is associated with the goddess Lakshmi, or so I'm assuming. I believe it may go by Tulsi, the name Tulsi. You can use it to calm yourself down. You can use it to um, as an all-over body tonic. If you want to grow basil in your house, you can use it to detract insects, like keep them away, and also to draw money into your life. I really like the smell of basil. I use it whenever I'm like cooking fish or making chicken or making soups. The next herb is shave grass. Shave grass is also known as horsetail. I am taking horsetail almost every day for two reasons. One, so that my hair color can change back to its original color. I have some silver hairs because on both sides of the family we go silver. So I've been using it to help keep my hair is black color to grow my hair and thicken it. But I'm also using it to strengthen my teeth because horsetail is high in silica. And silica helps with the teeth, the skin, the, the hair, the nails, all of that. It also assists in re the teeth. The next herb right here is red clover. These are red clover blossoms. Red clover is one of my favorite herbs. You can use it as a blood purifier for detoxification. You can use it if you are having some type of menstrual cramps or menstrual cycle issues. Supposedly, this herb shrinks tumors. So if you are one that's dealing with tumors or cancer, I think that this would be a good herb for you. But consult your doctor before you do that. The next herb is calendula. I don't exactly know what calendula is for, honestly, because I haven't taken my time out to research it, even though I sell it all the time. But I do know that you can use calendula if you have blonde hair to preserve the blondness of your hair. You can make a tea rinse and pour it on your hair and preserve the blondness of your hair. The next tea or herb is white oak bark. The woman in Herbally Yours mentions white oak bark. It helps with decaying teeth, which is something that I am dealing with now. I believe, honestly, my um, teeth issues came from the hepatitis B vaccine I got back in 2016, 2017. Because right after that, my teeth started breaking and this tooth broke off and that tooth broke off. So my goal is to grow it back and save my other teeth. So this is white oak bark. Dr. Christopher also mentions this herb in some of his lectures. God rest his soul. The next herb right here, I can't open it. Dang, did they just seal this bag? Okay, so this herb is Cascara Sagrada. A lot of followers of Dr. Sebi, who are our customers, come in and get this herb. I guess it was one of his recommended herbs. I'm not a follower of Dr. Sebi. I never really listened to his lectures or anything. But I know about some of his herbs because he has almost like a cult-like following. And the people will come in and like, Dr. Sebi recommended that. Dr. Sebi recommended this. So I'm assuming that this herb is for detoxification. I'm assuming. But don't quote me on that. The next herb is a rose, rose petals. You see? Oops, I'm just spilling all my herbs. I'm going to keep them in here. Next herb is rose petals. And rose petals 
are so sweet. They're so fragrant. A lot of people use them. What is going on? Sorry. My computer's acting up. A lot of people use them for magical rituals involving love, attracting love, also involving beauty. You can make rose water and use it to beautify your skin. I already have a pre-made rose water that I use every day, day and night, and I spray it on my skin. Um, in the book, Healing Oils of the Bible, the author mentions that the rose has a very high frequency, and some people consider it the fragrance of God. So if you are one that wants to smell fragrant and feel like you're holy and have a delicious drink, I think rose petals as a tea would be quite delicious. If you want to throw in some rose hips, you can because rose hips are high in vitamin C. The next herb is burdock root. This is one of our biggest sellers at my job. Like, it's huge. I'm assuming that burdock root is used for detoxification, but other people have used uh, burdock root for hair growth. The next herb is mullein. At the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were getting two major things. They were getting Irish sea moss and they were getting mullein. Mullein helps if you are consistently having mucus, if you are consistently having colds. This will expel mucus out of the lungs. It also helps with tumors in the lungs as well. The next tea is mugwort. Mugwort is not recommended if you are pregnant. I think it may have abortive properties. If you drink it when you're pregnant, it may cause an abortion. But this tea is mostly used if you want to have lucid, vivid dreams. Drink mugwort before you go to sleep. It's also used to cleanse magical tools. You can make the tea and cleanse the negative energy and banish using mugwort. You also can carry it on your person to protect you as well. This tea right here, I got this from Greenbush Natural. It is called Bus Tea. Greenbush Natural Products decided to create this tea based off of Dr. Duke who wrote The Green Pharmacy. They based it off of his recipe. It is supposed to increase the size of your breasts, and that is literally why I got it. I'm just like, I'm tired of being tiny. I want to be bigger. I haven't taken this tea in a while, but when I was taking it consistently, there were two things happening. One, my breasts started feeling heavier, and two, my face began to look more feminine. Like, it, it began to look softer. I believe because some of the herbs in here contain either estrogen, phytoestrogen, it has fenugreek, licorice, caraway, fennel, anise, or anise, basil, dill, lemongrass, and marjoram. Fenugreek and fennel were used by courtesans in order to increase their breast size. Fenugreek is also used to increase milk in um, nursing mothers. Dill seed, I don't know much about, but the first time I read about dill was in a book called Bio Young by Roxy Dillon or Dixon. And she gave dill essential oil to this woman who was having vaginal issues. I guess she had a loosening of her vagina or whatnot. And she created a concoction featuring dill and made the woman use it on that area and it tightened the area. So I think that's pretty neat. The next herb is oat straw. I don't know what all of the benefits of it are, except that it is, uh, it helps with teeth. That is literally the only reason I got it, to help with teeth. Uh, the next um, herb is yarrow. Dr. Christopher's student, Kurt King, mentions yarrow as one of his nine herbs in his book, Herbs to the Rescue, which I did a review on on this channel. And yarrow is a 
full body tonic. It is a blood cleanser and detoxifier. I haven't tried that much. I try to just sample the herbs one at a time, different mixtures and different things. Or if I can't use them all, I just use them in my, my um, magical rituals. This tea right here is called Female Joy. It is a sexual sensitivity tea by Health King. I use a lot of libido teas because I'm trying to strengthen my reproductive organs. I don't use them for libido, even though some people are like, oh, I use it for it. I actually just use it to strengthen my reproductive system so I can have an easier time conceiving when I decide to have children. This contains Chinese herbs. I'm pretty sure it may have donkai in there. Mm, nope. But it has astragalus and jasmine, so... Does it have Damiana? No, it does not. This tea, bamboo tea, I accidentally got three boxes of bamboo tea because I was um, signed into subscribe and save on Amazon and they sent me all these boxes. But bamboo tea, as I say, is great for the hair, skin, and nails. It is one of the highest tea and one of the highest herbs in silica. So if you want to grow your hair, have beautiful skin, you can drink this. I try to drink this at least once a week, but I feel I should start being more consistent with it. The last loose herb that I wanted to show you is blue lotus. I do not know exactly what it is used for, but I have been using it in replacement for um, cherry blossoms, like that cherry blossom tea recipe I told you about. This is from Thailand, and I got it at Love Goddess Healing Oasis, which is the only black metaphysical store in St. Louis. The next box is Clear Smooth Skin from Bravo Tea. It has Chinese herbs in there to help with beautifying the skin. I just got this maybe two or three days ago, so I haven't tried it yet. Most of my tea, if it is loose, I put it in my tea bags. I'll open it and scoop it and put it in my cup. I have this cup for sale. I'm going to put it on my website soon, so if you're interested in ordering one, you can. But this is my Name It and Clean It cup that I designed. I'm just throwing stuff at you, I'm sorry. This powder is a red reishi mushroom, also known as Ganoderma. This is a longevity mushroom, but um, I take it because it is high in B vitamins, and it also helps relax me. I like feeling calm. That is why I take it at night and not during the day before I have to go to work, because it calms me down. This tea is Moringa leaf powder. It is supposed to be a natural energy booster. I need to start taking this in the morning when I go off to work, but a lot of our customers buy this tea and add it to their smoothies. They're, they really, really love it. It's a super food. Next is comfrey root powder. If you are a person that breaks bones easily or you get fractures easily, you can use comfrey root as a poultice or you can drink it. It is known as knit bone because it can heal your bones very fast. I get comfrey root powder and I put it in my water, but I usually make it as a paste and put it on my teeth to strengthen the remaining teeth that I have as I try to regrow the other two that broke off. Damiana is a um, sexual stimulant. It helps to strengthen the uterus and the sex organs. Men and women can use it. A lot of our customers get it for libido mainly. <laughs> I know it's in a couple of libido blends. There's even one guy that buys like four bags once a week. I, I don't know if he sells them or if he uses them for something. I, I really don't know. But when I mix Damiana with Maca, I could feel the difference just having those two together because usually I'm just like, mm -hmm -hmm. but when I take Maca and Damiana together, I can feel the blood in my body. I feel my body heating up and I get really, really like ah, aggressive or assertive. So I try to take them separately and not together. The next herb is maca, 
This is maca root powder. You can get maca in capsules and all of that. It's a cruciferous root vegetable, and it is supposed to give you energy. It's supposed to give you um, help you with weight gain, hair growth, and strengthening your libido. So most people get it for libido mainly. When I was taking maca and my weight gain um, powder, I was starting to get curvier. Actually, the maca was making me very, very curvy. I'm still getting kind of curvier because I've been taking the maca every day. I take it in the morning so that I have the energy to stay awake throughout the day for work. <laughs> I wake up at literally 6 a.m., get on the bus at 7.30, get to work by 9.30, and work from 9.30 to 8 o'clock, and then come home at like 9 o'clock. So it is very long shifts, and I'm on my feet most of the day. So I need the strength <laughs> to deal with my work ethic and everything. And maca really helps me. It keeps me awake for at least, at least the first five or six hours of my shift. The next herb is amla. I haven't taken much of this. I bought it because I was using it on my hair. There's a YouTuber called Curly Proverbs that uses it in a lot of her products and she really likes it. She says it increases the density of the hair and helps to nourish the follicles and everything. But Amla has a high content of vitamin C and that is another reason why I selected it. I don't really like the taste, so I haven't really taken it like that. I try to at least sample all of my herbs or use them on some part of my body. The next powder is ashwagandha. It actually spilled. Ashwagandha is Indian ginseng. It is an adaptogenic, adaptogenic herb. You can use it for concentration and focus. Whenever I take ashwagandha, I just calm down. It helps with my anxiety. But I try to take it at nighttime just like the red reishi because it makes me way too calm where I'm just like, hmm, like that. The last powder is Fodi Root. The reason I have two bags is because just like the bamboo tea, I accidentally press subscribe and save. Fodi Root is also known as Heishowu, Hoshowu, however you pronounce it. It is named after uh, Mr. Black-Haired He. The story of Fodi Root is that it can change your hair from gray to its original color. So I've been taking that every single day. I also read in a book called The Little Urban Cyclopedia that a lot of elderly people regrew teeth after years of taking Fodi Root. So that is why I have increased my dosage of it. It's a rejuvenative herb. Regenerative. And this is what the powder looks like. We also sell the root, but I don't feel like boiling it or doing anything like that. I just don't have time. So yes, those are all of the herbs that I wanted to share with you. I hope you learned a lot from this video, and I hope you enjoyed learning about these different herbs, the tea recipes that I shared with you. If you are interested in this book, I got it off of Amazon, and be sure to leave a review for it as well. So thank you for watching this video, everyone, and happy reading to you all. Bye-bye.